So in this video, I want to continue talking about uh, applications of uh, second-order linear ODEs with constant coefficients and inhomogeneous terms. Uh, just to start with, I want to go a little bit uh, further talking about the applications, and then I'll do some calculations. So remember, in the previous video, I derived the equation mx double prime plus gamma x prime plus kx, and um, and I, I said that if we had an external force acting on this, then we would have an F of T on the right-hand side. So here I'm making the assumption that the rest position of our mass spring system is X naught. So there's the mass, there's the spring. There, oh, I need a dash pod in there, don't I? So let's get that in there so we have a bigger wall. So we have a spring with a mass and a dash pot, and we have mass there and dash pot and spring with spring constant k. And then let's say we have some time dependent forcing acting on it. So when we think of this as, so this is called a Kelvin Voigt model or Kelvin Voigt element. And when we think about this as a model for um, materials, so let's say intramolecular bonds in a large object with many of them, um, you have a bunch of different interpretations where this could be a useful model. So for example, uh, now I wouldn't necessarily want to use this exact equation, but if you consider, let's say, a large tall building, which you can think of as a whole bunch of beams with joints and weights on the beams, all the way in a sort of a lattice of some sort. If you think of the concrete as having also spring properties and so on all the way down, then when you have one of these buildings on the ground and there's an earthquake, the earthquake is shaking with some frequency. So F of T might be some periodic function and the whole object responds where let's say the X variable measures the deflection of the top of the building. So that's one situation where you might be trying to describe what's going on with one of these models. Another situation is a tuning fork. So if you take a tuning fork and you tap it on something, that's um, we'll see this interpreted as a delta function later, but if you tap it really hard on the side, it'll induce oscillations in the forks. And in fact, it'll induce an oscillation in one of the forks, and then the air pressure from one of them will cause the other one to start moving. So in the first case, you have a delta function for f of t that's banging into the first uh, fork or the first prong on the fork. And then the f of t for the second one is actually the periodic motion of the first one back and forth generates sound waves that bang into this one and also waves through the solid this way that will start to get the other one oscillating or vibrating as well. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to figure out how to analyze these types of situations. Well, we already have the machinery in place from previous, uh, previous work, a uh, previous chapter. So let's, uh, let's take a look at what that can do for us in terms of interpreting these. So let's first consider what we call the undamped oscillator. and that is when gamma is equal to zero. So in that case, we have this mx double prime plus kx equals zero. And if I don't start at the rest position, then I can have some x of zero equal x naught. And I'd like to solve that. So how do we do that? Uh, well, let's, uh, let's do what we we're supposed to do with these second order equations. So I'm gonna divide through and I'll get, actually I don't even need to divide through. We can plug in our ansatz right away and we get m r squared plus k, oh, so there's a zero times r and a k constant at the, at the end. And then this gives us r squared is equal to minus k over m. Now, k and m are certainly gonna be positive quantities, mass and spring stiffness. And so this means that we have r is equal to plus or minus i times the square root of k over m. And we call this 
quantity here, omega naught, and omega naught is referred to as the natural frequency. All right, so um, what does that give us? That gives us a solution x of t is equal to c1 cosine of omega naught times t plus c2 sine omega naught times t. And so you can see how does this behave if I make, if, if k increases, so making the, the, uh, the spring system stiffer, our frequency increases. And if m increases, we get a heavier mass on there, it's going to drive omega naught down, but in a, in a square root way. So doubling or um, increasing k or m by 4 has a factor of 2 change in omega naught. All right, so, um, so how do we... How do we sort of analyze this? Well, first of all, we have to solve the initial condition and figure out a C1 and C2, but let's just assume that that's a, an exercise to be done in any particular individual case. Um, the next case that I'm going to talk about is slightly more general, and this is the damped case. So that is mx double prime plus gamma x prime plus kx equal zero. And these are both unforced, right? We haven't talked about forcing yet. So what happens in this one? We get an m r squared plus gamma r plus k equals zero. And what are the roots here? So we have r equal, here I'm gonna use a quadratic formula and I get minus gamma over two m I'm splitting it up here into two pieces. There's uh, the minus b over 2a, and now I'm going to have the square root of gamma squared minus 4mk, and all that is also going to be divided by 2m. And you'll notice here I have a gamma time, uh, divided by 2m, and on this side I have a gamma squared under the square root sign divided by 2m, so I'm going to factor that out as a gamma over 2m, and in brackets here I have to put a minus 1 for the first term, plus or minus, and now under the square root sign, I'm going to have that gamma square gets pulled out, turns into the gamma that I have out in front, so that's just going to be one left over there. Um, and then I'm pulling out a gamma from the square root, or a gamma squared, so I have minus 4mk divided by gamma squared. Okay, so uh, looking at this expression, you can see that there are a few possibilities. So I'm going to call possibility one is when um, 4mk over gamma squared. Uh, so that quantity, it's all positive parameters. So we know that this quantity is definitely greater than zero. And let's assume in case one that this is smaller than one. So when that's the case, the square root sign has a positive quantity underneath it. So let's just try and see what that means. I'm going to draw, oops, I'm going to draw the number line here. And so let's put zero here and minus one here. And if we look just inside the brackets, all of this is going to get multiplied by gamma over 2m, but that's a positive quantity, so it doesn't change the signs. So we start off here with a minus one, and we're going to add and subtract something. So we start at minus one, and we're going to add a number to get the root of the characteristic equation, and we're going to subtract to get the second root. And now the question is, do we go this far, or do we go much further and pass by? So in one case, we'd have two negative roots, and the other case, we'd have a negative and a positive root. So clearly the one down here, the one that you subtract off, is going to be a negative. So there's definitely one exponential decay in this solution. And what about the other case? So if 4mk over gamma squared is less than 1, the number underneath the square root sign is definitely going to be less than 1 as well in this case. And so what that means when I take a square root of it, it's still going to be less than 1. And that means that we are going to be adding back less than 1 and subtracting off less than 1. And in that case, we have two negative roots. And
and that means that solutions all decay exponentially. So for this type of a spring, that means that our mass spring system, the mass, so let's say we have the spring and the mass, if we pull the mass out to here and we let it go, it's going to exponentially return to the middle with no overshoot, no oscillation. It just comes down smoothly, monotonically, just like an, uh, an exponential function or the sum of two exponential functions, but same basic look to it. Okay, the next case is when 4mk over gamma squared is equal to one. Oh, uh, just jumping back here, a definition. So we call this case here, this is the overdamped oscillator. Overdamped because the damping is strong enough to make this fraction here less than one so it's large the large damping limit and that's what kills the oscillation the possibility for oscillations okay so the next case um, this is right at the threshold to getting a, a negative under that square root sign and this is what we're going to call critically damped and what happens in this case is we get that r is equal to uh, gamma over 2m minus 1 plus or minus this whole square root is just 0. So we have a repeated root. And that means that our solution is going to involve an exponential e to the minus gamma over 2mt and uh, c2 t e to the minus gamma over 2 m times t. And this is slightly different. So if I forget about the exponential term and I just think about the t times exponential, a t times exponential, it will give me the possibility if I start, let's say, up here, it can overshoot and then decay back to zero. So there's a little bit, there's like a hint of on the edge of an oscillation, um, but it not, even then, not always. And, and it's never more than one bounce back. And this is the critically damped case. And then if we go a little bit further with gamma, so now in order to make 4mk over gamma squared, now if this is greater than 1, then the square root of 1 minus that quantity is certainly going to be imaginary. And you can see that happens when gamma is small. So if there's very little damping, we're almost in the undamped version where we had pure oscillations, but here we're gonna get a little bit of decay. So what are the R values in this case? The R values are gonna be gamma over two times M minus one plus or minus. And now because the thing under the square root is going to be negative, I'm gonna factor out a minus one from the, under the square root sign, which puts an i out in front. The minus square root of 1 goes here. And then I can flip 4mk over gamma squared minus 1, reverse the order of those two. So that's now a positive quantity. And now we can see that um, we're going to have, this is going to be in the form alpha plus beta i, where alpha is equal to minus gamma over 2m, a negative number and beta is going to be equal to gamma over 2m times the square root. And you can multiply that in and it'll change the look of it a little bit, but um, so, so we get beta is equal to, when I multiply it in, I get uh, the gammas cancel on the first term and a two becomes a four and cancels and the m becomes m squared. So I have the square root so we have uh, m in the denominator, k in the numerator, and the gammas disappear, minus, this is just a different way of writing it, right? Gamma squared over 2m all squared, so 4m squared. Okay, and so in either, either case, so what we have here is we have exponential decay, C1, or actually I'll put the c1s inside, so I have an e, to the alpha t where alpha is negative, so that's exponentially decaying, and then c1 cosine beta t plus c2 sine beta t. 
and this is the underdamped oscillator. And it shows both the oscillatory phenomenon here and the exponential decay, and it looks something like this. And even though it's not a periodic function, it still has regular zeros, and so we call beta the pseudo-frequency. Okay, so that is a summary of what we have with the homogeneous case, where there's no forcing. Okay, in a separate video, I'll follow up with uh, a more complicated case, which is when you have forcing, and we'll look in particular when you have periodic forcing, and we're going to find some interesting phenomenon, and the most interesting of it is what we call resonance, and there are many applications of this resonance idea.